Welcome, Lax fans, to the Lax News Update solo show today. Just me with you here live from Denver. You might not get this live, but I'm live right now. Okay, Lax News Update. It is December 5th, 2020. We're getting close uh, to 2021. Thank goodness what a year this has been. Um, some really good topics I wanted to discuss in the news this week. Um, first one, Alyssa Murray, the Syracuse lacrosse star, um, former star, but everybody remembers her team, USA star, um, pro star. She's been writing some really good articles on Inside Lacrosse and Isle Women. Um, this one was, was kind of titled, I hope you don't think I'm one of those crazy parents, but, and those of us coaches have all heard that phrase. And when that phrase comes out, I mean, 99% of the time they are, you know, a little overzealous, we'll just call it. I still um, am a coach, so still will kind of keep some, I could drop some amazing stories on this topic and name names and stuff like that, but that's not the point of the show. We're trying to spread um, positive vibes. It's easy to go negative, um, but, you know, let's talk about her, her thoughts here real quick. Um, she kind of talked about when, she played club. I think she was a Yellow Jackets player. I'm pretty sure I remember her telling me that um, at some point in time. But she was like, I played for a top club. Um, loved it. We had a great time. Liked the players. It was super fun. And you could feel that negative energy come out as soon as the game was over and they were going to the sideline. And, and some of the um, parents who, who, who are overzealous, they, they think they're so good at hiding it. And Alyssa's like, no, you didn't. And not from the players. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from the article um, that would be just, just important to know is that like these kids are having so much fun and, and you're upset about they didn't shoot enough. And the amount of that all the time is, is out of control. Like, why don't you shoot more? And, and I've lacked poetic a lot on how um, we're looking for more than that as college coaches, as pro coaches, as high school coaches, as evaluators, we're looking for more than just shooters. So um, people always think that's a thing. So, you know, and, and they, she kind of mentioned also, like they pull a coach aside. And I don't think anyone knows. I remember the first time I ever saw it happen, um, you know, growing up in upstate New York, we're, it's funny. I've heard, I heard people say when I was little, like we're, it's a bit of a time kind of lapse or warp. I'm not sure which one's the right term there but uh we're kind of behind the trends of the rest of the country so as we've been hearing about it at other places that coaches and parents were involved we didn't see it nearly as much it, it's over the top now if you you know mike masseur at, at west jenny was well documented recently how, how just crazy even upstate is now but um i saw it happen the first time um one of the greatest wins i was a part of and um and again, I'm not trying to, I know people can, can figure out who I'm talking about quick. If I, if I name teams, so I'm just going to keep it vague. And, and a dad went over and was chewing the parent out and we just won this amazing game. And one of the biggest upsets in New York state history. Uh, and it wasn't for Penn Yen. It did not happen to Penn Yen. So, um, but it saw it happen and, and it's just like, wow, really? And, and you just, you felt bad for the coach, you know, you just, and, and for, um, I don't forget how many people were on that team, but for, you know, the rest of the team, that was one of the greatest moments of their sports life. And, and to have that negativity surrounded just, just stank. So, so good job, Alyssa pointed out, we all know it's happening. It's getting um, crazier every year. The, I'll tell high school coaches some stories and they'll tell us stories and, and they have it worse at the high school and club level. Uh, but they'll be surprised at how much interaction we actually get. Um, I had a top club reach out. Recently, multiple top clubs we've talked to just about how to how to deal with their parents and expectations and just not believing what they're saying and um, tough trend. But one of my favorites was when I was recruiting D3 and I'd never I didn't play D3. I would never coached D3 and I was working at a pretty high academic institution. And, you know, it was, it was you know, right outside the elite elite. So like if they didn't get into the top like NESCAC schools and they'd look at this school and. So the, the recruiting talk with the families was always about academics. And, 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 and I grew up with teachers as parents, as teachers and coaches. And, and that was preached to me since I was little. And I went to Georgetown and had great grades. And 
you know, uh, so lacrosse and academics are hand in hand to me. So that was easy. So we'd always kind of talk to them about, hey, you know, academics come first and foremost. We're not going to do more than two hours of practice and, and, and all these things that I was passionate about and remain true to. And it was funny to me that all of these families would sit there and, and it was a little hard for me to get used to, but I just, I knew what I was getting into kind of, you know, they'd just be like, Hey, lacrosse, isn't that important to, to my daughter? And, and even though it was a little bit, but they did really hammer that home in the process. Like they're not going to pick it their school based on the lacrosse coach, the lacrosse facilities, the lacrosse, you know, winning is great, but that's not what they're looking for. And as soon as they got there, and not the kids, kids are always great. As soon as they got there, the parents wanted this SEC football experience. It was nuts. Um, it was a great learning experience for me because they'd always say one thing. And, and then as soon as they got there, it'd be way different. They'd be like, well, why don't we have this amazing new locker room? Like, where's the, why is there no video replay on the scoreboard? I got that. Um, just funny stuff and, and uh, just a lot to deal with. And, and like I said, um, the kids, don't really know or the young players don't really know how much their parents are involved and it's really funny um I've worked with some coaches over the years and I've never done this but I'm going to next time I'm a head coach probably be like hey I'm gonna have to tell your your kid you're contacting me I know my coach did that in college we only dealt with it once as far as we knew he came in the film room and was like hey uh I'm not going to say the player's name, but he said the player's name. He said, your dad called me for a whole team. I was shocked. Uh, I was like, whoa, I didn't, I was like, parents are calling college coaches. Wow. This was 2002. Um, we were top five in the country at the, at the time. Um, kid was, kid was a good player, but he was like the fourth attack man. And the dad wasn't happy with the playing time. So, you know, and, and that's what, what people just discount all over the country. Anyways, when you're on a team that good, it's not really, it's where you fit. It's, it's other things are going on. It doesn't mean you're not a good player. Um, so interesting article, check it out inside lacrosse.com. Um, like I said, Oh, one other point I want to bring up on that. Um, it, it started when I first, my first like full paying assistant job was at Binghamton. I was in a, a volunteer assistant coach for one season at Georgetown. We made the elite eight learned a lot that year, but the next year when I'm actually running an offense, I'm the first assistant offensive coordinator, recruiting coordinator, parents think they can divide coaching staffs at the tailgates and things like that. So you need a strong, you know, a strong culture within your program. You need parents like telling other parents what's acceptable, what's not. And, and you just need, everybody likes compliments. And, and I've just seen so many young assistants and, and think that like and it happened to me like, oh, yeah, no, they like me more. No, they don't. They're just trying to get what they want at the end of the day. So really interesting stuff. Um, we try to be in as where I coach now and, and where I've coached the last five, 10 years. We try to involve the parents as much as possible just because it's just they're a part of it. Um, we want them to be a part of it. We want them to be a good experience for everyone. But um, it is tough to watch some of the things that go on um around the country msl news major series lacrosse we talked on the Burrow boys podcast check it out with zach and josh courier about how this league uh, we're going to try to bring more attention to it on this show uh is great league i played in it um senior a they played for the man cup um the brampton excelsiors are going to move to owen sound or trying to move okay so it was first announced they're going to move to owen sound my first thought was good because Brampton plays in the power eight center. It was actually my first game in senior a um, I've been cut that, that winter by Toronto rock. I was told I was the last guy cut and made it to the last cuts, made it through rookie free agent camp. You know, I was like a 26 year old free agent. I'd played a little senior B box. Uh, according to them, I'd, I'd never played any box, even though we grew up playing box without pads and penny. And we'll talk about that later. Um, had a great camp, great experience. Troy Cordingly was the coach. Um, Sanderson, forget his first name, was the D coach. Um, he since passed away, but some legendary coaches. John Lovell, I think his name was. Learned some good drills from that guy. Really fun camp. Great players. I think they went on to win the championship that year. Um, but I got caught. They were like, hey, play senior A this summer. If you play senior A this summer, you'll make the team next year. So 
uh, went and played for Ajax, which was a new team coached by Jim Veldman. Figured I'd, I'd get to play every game. Brampton had offered me to play um, for their senior B team, which was in like Wellington. At the, I didn't even know where that was. It was like an hour and a half away. And they were like, you can play 20 games for senior B and then we'll call you up for senior A. And I was also playing MLL. And I just kind of, you know, Jim Veldman, I grew up really idolizing him as a player. And they'd, they'd offer me to be on the team and play every game in senior A. So I was like, let's do it. And then first game, I get a healthy scratch. So I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Um, we lose the game. They were like, hey, Queener, we just wanted you to see what senior A was like before we threw you in a game. And I was like, I t- <laughs> and uh, about to send this to the coach, but I, I was kind of a jerk. I was like, hey, yeah, I'm not going to figure it out by watching. I need to get out there and play. So they dressed me first game or my first game, Powerade Center, Brampton. There's 10 fans there. It's a great barn. They were the reigning Man Cup champs. Brody Merrill, why I'm in Canada at the time kind of helped me get on these teams and talk to people is playing against me. It was pretty, my brother Brett was there because I think we had a Toronto nationals game that weekend. It was like a Thursday game in Brampton. Uh, first time I got the ball, I was so mad. I, I sprint up the floor and I scored a goal. My first goal in the, in the league, I creased over. I think I was actually in the crease because you can't in senior A dive through the crease, but the goal, the goal, uh, really fun experience. I was getting chirped the whole game. Like, Hey, you American. I was the only American that summer and, and, uh, in the league and, and, and took a lot of heat and Brody, uh, thankfully I, I know he told them, Hey, leave Maloney's He's a good guy. Cause I don't know if I would have made it out that game without somebody jumping me. Um, but it was super fun. And, and, but I remember always thinking like this team's so good, like they were loaded and they had no fans. So, and you've seen it like when Halifax is now, or the Nighthawks went to Halifax and they, they pack the barn. Saskatchewan packs the barn. Like these other areas that don't have as many things going on um, could pack the barn. So I thought right away, like, this is a great move. Like pack the barn, let's go. But there's been some, some, uh, some other thoughts about it. The Brampton mayor put out a statement. I believe it was the mayor saying, we're going to keep the team. So lawyers are getting involved. I don't know what's happening, but um, Let's just see what other people's thoughts are on this. There's been some writings on it. I just really think that Owen Sound are going to have fans. And, and you saw Six Nations Chiefs are saying they they are they might struggle in the future to put a team together because they're not getting fans because their junior A and junior B are so big down. The junior B is like really big on Six Nations. Um, that's one. I've never seen a junior B game there. Um, maybe do that. But try to talk more about uh, the MSL on the show, so we'll keep, we'll keep you posted on that. But I think it'd be cool if we went to Owen And hey, if Brampton really wants a team, why not just keep the Brampton team, make the Owen Sound team new? That was my first thought, but I'm sure that I think Jeff T. I know Jeff T. On, on Brampton, so and I think Clark, pretty sure Clark Peterson's there, so they got a young core, so they probably want those players. Um, but neat MSL news. Uh, Terry Foy, inside lacrosse, wrote an article debate. Thanksgiving table debate. We're a little bit past Thanksgiving. I took a little bit of a break. Uh, didn't go home. Didn't see the family. Um, miss you guys. But um, do we count offenses from up top or behind? This is a, this is an interesting one for me. Upstate, I believe, counts from behind. I've tried to switch from up top. We're talking about formation. So a one four one. Um, I would count the one from behind, which is X, and then four across, and then one up top. Or a two three one. We got two behind the goal. Three. And then one up top. Um, I don't know what you do. Three, three. It's easy when the numbers are easy. It's easy, but it's tough. Lingo's tough. Um, I tend to talk in strong hand lingo a lot. And so I'll be like, righties over here, lefties over here, like box. And University of Denver, we have we have uh, so many lefties that we could we can actually we had some sets last year when we were playing where we had four lefties on the field, three righties. And when I used to coach at the Hill Academy men's we had a set where we had five lefties on the field, one righty. So it's fun for me to play that style um, and coach that style. And, but then I'll be like, but this is the lefty alley, which is the other side. So lingo's tough. That's why it's nice to be around your team for a while. They start to figure out what you're saying, what you think. There's so many things in lacrosse to talk about. Kind of why I started this podcast. Um, let me know where you come from, up top or behind. Let me know. Uh, Twitter today, just this morning. Get on Twitter, my favorite social media platform at coach Q 88 uh, Joe Keegan like this guy on Twitter a lot. Uh, he tweeted, would it be better to have two different release points on your shot or be equally as good right lefty? Now here's the thing. 
I've coached and played this game for a long time. There, I mean, are a handful of guys or girls that are equally as good with both hands. And there's still a lot of coaches saying that you need to be perfectly the same with both hands. That's just not the case. Like, it just doesn't happen. Um, one of my favorite things in pro uh, in the MLL all the time would be like, he's a righty, he's a righty. Well, he's in the MLL because he's a righty. Like, he's good at scoring righty. So I think you're better off spending more time developing different shots. Um, it's one of the things that I really coach a lot um, and, and, and have for a long time because I've just seen that the great players shoot from different angles. Look at John Grant Jr. He does not just shoot one way. But I always point out to my – scorers John Gray Jr. when he needs a goal he's got a very good high to low shot overhand and tight like he knows how to score obviously that's a not dropping <laughs> big big news news flash there but if you watch the greats they, they do have fundamental finishing ability and I always say like hey when you're in tight you got to be able to do the fundies you got to be able to high to low it um but another thing I talk about is like everybody will just, you know, you miss a high shot. They'll be like, oh, why didn't you shoot a low? And it's it's really challenging at different angles to shoot low. It is not that easy. And really good goalies know when you're just going to throw a low shot because, you know, you're at a you're at a tricky angle. Coach might not want you to shoot sticks that high. So, you know, I think you're ready, much better off being deceptor, Decepticon, I like to call it sometimes, you know, and, and leaners and, and try to move your stick. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. Goalie wars, full goal, three by speed, backyard locks. Those games teach you how to use different angles of your stick. I tweeted back to Joe and was like, hey, you know, I if I could go back in time, I don't have that many, like, I wish I did this differently things. Uh, but one of them, I mean, I spent way too much time, one, in the weight room, and two, um, trying to shoot lefty on the run. Like, I would lift weights, oh, let's try to get, you know, our thing at Georgetown was like, if you didn't bench 225 five times, you were in trouble. Um, you know, and, and to me, that's a waste of time. Strength, strength conditioning is better. Well, I won't get off topic on this, but, um, with too much, too much time trying to max out on bench, too much time trying to max out on squats. Cause coach had to, was real big on that and, and your run test times and, um, real, and then I go on the field and I'd be like, all right, I gotta get my left hand as good as my right hand. And I'd spend hours shooting lefty and my lefty shot. I mean, it got better, but I just know. If I were to go back, I just wouldn't do that. And, and I'm not saying the players shouldn't have a good weekend. I think Jason Page, head coach at QK College, um, really uh, has a good philosophy on this. He was a great player at, at Washington College, All-American, lefty attackman. He's like, you need to get one with your weekend, like if you, a game, right? So you should be getting three with your, with your strong, one with your weak, because they're just going to give you your weak. Um, because I do tend to coach strong hand too much. I think, um, but I, I definitely, I don't want to watch players waste time. We did this at the Hill Academy. We just be like, this is, we, Brody, me and Patrick would sit down and then when Merrick got there and we all, we all agreed, you know, let's not try to make these kids who are super strong, dominant with one hand into American two-hand players. What we did with them and we talked about it all the time was guys, what we want you to be able to do is pass and catch with your weekend. Cause I do think that's very important. You know, if teams are going to pressure and stuff, if you can't, unless you're the most ridiculous, like with your, with your weekend, every like a Zach or your strong hand, you're like a Zach Miller and, and you can, you know how to do everything. Then, then the, the, the not as elite player, they're still pretty good. I think just needs to be able to pass and catch with it, but release points for sure. We, we do drills where we, we try different shots. We, we, we do them in passing drills. We, we, we try our twisters behind the backs around the world all the time. Low to high, high, low bouncers, three quarters. Um, as long as that wrist is snapping, it's a good shot. So cool stuff on Twitter by Joe. Follow him. If you don't, he's a good follow. Um, one more topic for you today. This is, this is one that's gotten me in trouble on Twitter before with people and it's what's tough on Twitter, which is great. I got a podcast now, so I can talk about it a little bit more. But Lax All Stars has an article up: five ways box lacrosse can improve your field game. So we're all very aware that box lacrosse can improve your skills. It's fun. It's great. Um, I'm gonna give you some hot takes of my own. I'm not even gonna talk about the article. Go read it. It's fine. I mean, it's, just, it's the same. It's good. It's the same stuff we've always talked about. But what I'm gonna tell you about is you do not have to play 
the full pad box version in Canada if you don't have the money for your players. Like, so my dad started with other people and my mom, um, uh, the box rank of Penny in 1992-ish, it could be 93. But, you know, if, if, if he tried to make, I mean, it was 20 bucks and it still is for your whole family for the summer. Um, and if he tried to then... And he had, he got, you know, local businesses to pitch him money and he got equipment. So kids could just come and get the equipment to play. You know, we didn't have the, the money to buy uh, kidney pads and shoulder pads and all the stuff. So we basically were playing helmets, gloves, arm pads. Now he would teach the cross check hole, but we didn't hammer and we didn't slash, you know, you just played good rules and, 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 you know, uh, the proof's in the pudding, man. Penny Ann has put out some of the best players ever. Brad Queen or Michael Manley. Um, Pat Kugman was a great pro. You know, I played pro. Bradley Voigt's playing pro. I'm going to miss some guys. You know, we've had for a village of 5,000 people. I mean, this is why this, this in our, in our training in the, in the high school level, because we didn't cross it. So summer we played box. Um, and, and in the spring we played field. And in the winter we played a box version um, with a pinky ball and mini nets. And, and that was a really fun game too. Um, but we played all these different versions of the sport. And that's why, like, it's always funny to me when, when the Canadians would tell me, like, oh, you've never played box. I'd be like, man, we played in a smaller box with no pads and just killed each other um, and got a lot tougher. And, and, and it was a blast. So um, a lot of, lot of places in upstate now have box ranks. And I, I just think that you, you got to realize you don't, um, you don't need all the bells and whistles to really pull it off. I know there's a place in Texas um that i'm following uh in san antonio that does it i, I don't think they're wearing all the pads you don't need i mean it's it is it fun to put all the pads on sure you know is it like i love that version too it's just you know if you listen to the show and and our thoughts on the game there's just so many versions to play so that's a tip for you um and this is where i've gotten in trouble on twitter i've said hey girls don't need to put all the pads on um recruited some players in the past to, to play girls box. I love girls box. I, I think it's great. Like it's just said, like play more versions, but you know, we weren't going to get girls to do that in Penny Ann in the early nineties. So my mom had them, you know, just play the game with their, with their girl stick and, and no pads and, you know, Penny Ann girls put out a lot of great players. So, and, and they're physical and they're tough and they're not worried about it. Loyola does it um, every year. They'll play a winter league, uh, the, the college, um, they're top 10 now and they play every year and they don't pad up. And to me, like, yeah, it, it like I said, I'm not against it. I'm just saying that if I'm going to, if I'm coaching and, and we're doing it at university of Denver, I'm not trying to buy the helmets, the, the kidney pad and not a money issue. Uh, we're supported. Like we could probably pull that off. If we wanted to. Um, but then I'm giving the kids a stick. They're not going to use in the regular season. So um, while I do like the game, I think that's a fun version to play and, and you can drop it down to four players. Um, and, and, and I've seen before, uh, and, and use a softer ball and then you got softer hands. So it's the in tight stuff that I like and, and all that. So those are fun for your groups. Um, I can talk about it all day. Um, coaching tip, Let's see where I have it here. Lost it. If you're watching on YouTube, I guess I don't have it with me, but mask up, uh, where'd my mask go? Um, had a few in the apartment, but can't find them now. Um, mask up, you know, let's do it. We're, we're going to, we like to play some games soon. Um, it's important and you can have fun with your mask. Let me find it here. I'll be right back. Uh, yeah, I got it. So it's fun. It matches my hat, which is the Arapaho ski basin. Uh, but it's a grateful dad. So I got a grateful dad mask now. Uh, with the A Basin insignia logo in there, so it's pretty cool. Um, just amazing to me how 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 quick some people want to adapt, right? Like back in March, I was like, man, we're gonna wear masks. Like this is wild. Now we're wearing them everywhere. So, um, help out your fellow lacrosse player. That's my coaching tip: wear a mask. Thanks for tuning in. Check out all the stuff. We're gonna start dropping podcasts on Instagram. What is it TV? IGTV. Uh, people told me they wanted on there, so I'm gonna put it on there. Um, hope you all have happy holidays. Got some stuff coming out for you soon. Keep checking in. Love, lax, ABC, always be cradling. Bye.